And we're back, everyone. So talk two from uh, Conference Strand 2 today. Um, it's the focus of much um, un public unrest in the UK. We, when we suddenly have our tomato supply uh, stopped, people get very aerated about it. So hopefully Sean Tyndale uh, at Way Beyond can tell us how CEA can help tomato production. Sean, it's all yours. I look forward to hearing it. Yeah, cool. Thank you very much. Um, good good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I'm joining you from Auckland New the evening for me, but I'm um, very happy to be presenting for this lot today. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a, a technologist first and more, foremost with a specialization in, in data. Um, I look after the, the products and technology at a company called Waybeyond. Uh, what Waybeyond do is we help um, commercial produce growers, uh, uh, top tier seed companies optimize the yield and the quality of their production. And we do that through our expertise in artificial intelligence, data and uh, plant science. And we deliver that expertise through a cloud platform, platform that we call Farm Road. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about why um, we think that the, the application of context around the prediction of yield for tomatoes is a much more powerful combination of tools than just focusing on yield prediction on its own as the holy grail. Over the next 20 minutes, I'm gonna cover a few things. Firstly, we're gonna have this sort of background question of is actually high yield prediction accuracy the holy grail approach? Should growers really be focusing on absolute precision with their yield prediction? And spoiler alert, I'm going to suggest today that that's not the right focus. I'm then going to introduce a concept uh, we call yield swings, which is basically deviations in a positive or negative direction from yield prediction for tomato growers. I'm also going to talk about the causes of yield swings, and I'm going to show how yield swings are a real killer for uh, yield prediction precision. And then lastly, I'm going to discuss a little bit around how using this context that I'll cover can help yield prediction become a much more powerful tool that can help drive more consistent uh, yield for growers around the world. But firstly, why do we, why do, we do yield prediction? Um, I'll just touch on this for a bit of context. Yield prediction can be a really uh, powerful tool for business decision making. It's not just for the growers. Um, it can help make uh, uh, businesses make decisions around the allocation of land. How much land are they going to allocate to certain crop types? Um, how are they going to plan their re resource usage for a coming season? By resource usage, I mean fertilizers, water, uh, pest and control products. Of course, yield prediction is a powerful tool for growers as well. Yield prediction can help give growers an early uh, trigger Point, I guess, to help them plan early intervention should a prediction be saying that their crops are perhaps going off target. And then lastly, back to the, the business, um, it can really be a powerful tool in helping a business have confidence in its contractual obligations. You know, Are they on track to fulfill their contractual obligations? If they're not, do they perhaps have to start looking for a plan B, perhaps work with third parties to, to get extra produce to fulfill their contractual commitments? Just quickly, a little bit of background also on uh, yield prediction, modern yield prediction today and, and a little bit of technical background. How is it generally approached nowadays? It, probably one of the more popular ways is using what we call machine learning models. And organizations, uh, typically quite technical organizations, will work with growers and train models. And the way that models are trained is by using vast amount of historical data around the performance, the environment, and the observations of a crop and its yield. And we give that to a computer and the computer figures out a complex network of rules for us, far too complex for a human to figure out. And it's that set of rules that we call a model. Then we can use this model to play through today's data to predict the future. But there are some challenges with this approach. There's a lot of challenges, actually. It requires vast amounts of quality historical data. <clears throat> if you don't have quality data and you put garbage in, you're going to get garbage out. Um, and if you have the quality data, that's just one step. Typically, you need multiple seasons of quality data to train these models. And the more data you typically give these models, the better they get. 
But we know not everybody's actually got the, this, this data. And if they do, you know, via climate computers, often this data can be locked up as little digital islands in the greenhouse. So it's, it's not always available or easily available. And something that we're learning at Way Beyond um, in the last couple of years is we're, we're hearing from some of our customers, some of our, our network that it's actually getting harder to have reliable modeling, re reliable um, machine learning modeling, because what some growers are seeing is that what's happened in history um, over multiple seasons, unfortunately, is not happening now and it's not happening in the future. We're seeing, you know, wilder swings in our climate, more extreme weather events, which is making training reliable models uh, more difficult. And then lastly, these models are not perfect. They're a prediction. They, they aren't a crystal ball. Um, so they, they sometimes don't work. And they can be an incredibly useful tool when they work. If a, if, if a prediction is telling you you're going to get perhaps 20,000 kgs of tomatoes one week and that's what you pick, Wonderful, that that I'm sure has helped a business make some really uh, quality decisions leading up to, to that picking. But if it's telling you you're doing 20,000 kgs and you pick 8,000 kgs, not really useful. And um, you know, you've potentially made some bad decisions for the business leading up to that. So with all these challenges in mind, you know, the, here's the question again, is, is aiming for high yield prediction accuracy the right approach? And we don't think so. We think a much more holistic approach is needed for growers, one that takes into account not only a yield prediction in isolation, but many factors of context around the yield prediction. We believe that um, environment is a powerful piece of context. What is actually going on with the plant as well? And how are growers tending to manage their crops? We, we think that having a combination of context in these different areas can help growers interpret a prediction and, and gain higher or lower confidence around that prediction when looked at holistically. So this, this hypothesis that I've sort of talked about around why context is perhaps a much more uh, smart and powerful approach. We explored it at Way Beyond uh, and we did a study into it. And I wanna tell you a little bit about what we, what we discovered. Um, what you're seeing on screen here, firstly, is a typical tomato uh, crop, crop cycle of, I think this one's about 45 weeks in duration. The green line is showing us the, the actual observed harvest, what actually happened in the real world. The red dotted line there is a loose approximation of what a yield prediction model may predict in this particular case. And then the red dots you're seeing there are what we call swing weeks, where the, the reality has been that there's been an, you know, a significant overproduction from what the prediction was saying or a significant underproduction from what the prediction was, was saying. These we call, again, yield swings. So we hypothesize that there's a lot that we can learn from these yield swings. We saw these as an indicator for drilling into and doing a study around to help perhaps build a, a picture of context for when you know, for what is actually going on when yield prediction gets it wrong. So we, we did a study like I suggested, um, and what we did was we, we took approximately 1,000 weeks of tomato production data. And when I say tomato production data, I'm talking about environment data, the actual observed yield, and um, observations around the crop via crop registration. And then we also took yield prediction data from a range of different yield prediction approaches, such as the one I described earlier. And um, what we did was we looked at the predictions across that data and we grouped the predictions into three different groups. The first group we defined as the high accuracy group. So we put all of the, the data together that was for organizations that were getting or growers that were getting high accuracy with a yield prediction practice that they had underway and this group was typically achieving 89 95 percent accuracy <clears throat> next we defined a, a sort of mid-level accuracy group and they were typically achieving 85 to 89 percent accuracy and then we defined a lower uh, lowest accuracy level group in the range of 80 to 85 percent 
Next, what we did with these groups is we took a look at the prevalence or the, you know, how many instances on average we were typically seeing these yield swing events, both in a positive and ne negative direction that I talked about before. And here's what we found. So our hypothesis uh, to have a look here at these yield swing events, we, we showed with evidence that this was a good place to start to explore why you know variations in yield prediction accuracy can happen. You can see here that quite intuitively, but, but proved with evidence here, um, lower yield prediction accuracy groups tend to have much uh, more of these swings, yield swings, these yield swing weeks. Whereas as you get to higher levels of accuracy, you're seeing a lot less of these yield swing weeks. And we think this is particularly interesting for the, the mid to low tech CEA grower. Mid to low tech CEA growers typically have a little less control over their environment um, and less control sometimes over their practices as well. And in our experience, we see that uh, mid and low tech growers are more susceptible to variation in the thing in, in the data um, that we explored as part of the study. <clears throat> so, does this mean that yield prediction is a isn't a useful tool for these low to mid tech growers? I'm not suggesting that at all. Um, quite to the contrary, we think it can still be a powerful tool when applied with the context of understanding what's going on with these yield swings. At least this was our, our thesis and we wanted to explore this even more and even deeper. So, so let's have a look at what we've discovered with across this uh, approximately thousand weeks of uh, tomato production data, what we discovered as the more uh, prevalent patterns that was influencing uh, yield swings. The way we did this was we first looked at the low yield swing events and we, from the point of the event or the point of that, that low yield uh, deviation from the prediction, we looked eight weeks back at all of the data holistically, so environment data and crop data via crop registration, and we looked for patterns. We looked to try and find what were the patterns that were leading up to these low swing weeks. And here's what we found. I'll just quickly talk about the top, the top three patterns that we discovered. So the, the, the most common pattern for low yield pressure, or let's say low yield deviation from yield prediction, was a low outside night temperature, which I personally found quite interesting because that's not really something we can control in CEA, is it? Uh, and certainly something that uh, low to mid tech growers have less defense against, I guess, or less control to, to compensate for. Next was low total light conditions over that over an eight preceding eight weeks. That makes sense. You know, we're giving less energy to the plant. So yeah, yeah, it makes sense that it's um, underproducing from what an algorithm might, um, a computer model might be telling us. And then the third, the third most prevalent uh, pattern we found was a low difference between the internal day temperature and night temperature of the greenhouse. And what I mean by low difference is if your day temperature is 17, uh, let's say 19 degrees actually, and your night temperature is um, 18 degrees, you've only got a one degree difference between day and night. And we, we classify something like that as low difference in temperature. Then next, what we did was look at the high yield swing events, the inverse of, of what I showed you before. And we took exactly the same methodology where we looked at what, what looked at each of the weeks where we were overproducing from what different yield prediction approaches were telling us. And we took eight weeks data of data before that, and we looked for these patterns again. And here's what we found for the, um, the patterns contributing to high yield. Again, the top three I'll mention, uh, and, and uh, the number one most common pattern was a high difference between the internal day and night temperatures in the greenhouse. So a high range of temperature on day and night. You know, I gave the example where it might, might be one degree before, maybe it's five, eight, ten degrees temperature range um, as classified as a high deviation in day and night temperature. Then uh, the second most common pattern was high outside night temperature. 
again, something we can't really do much about, and certainly for the low and mid tech grower, they have limited control to compensate. And then lastly, um, high total light. And that makes a lot of sense again, intuitively, that the, the high total light, we're giving you know, the, the, the crop more, more energy uh, and, and more production, therefore. But um, we thought this was interesting. Like we thought, you know, this this now can start to give in a, from from the climate data that we have, give some context, and we can, you know, almost produce a library of these patterns for a grower. And when we see these patterns occur in line with our yield prediction, it can just start to give a little bit of context as to how much we can rely upon a yield prediction at that time to make a decision in, you know, in a positive direction or negative direction. Um, but we didn't just look at climate to sort of build this library of context for tomato growers. We also looked at the plant itself, and I'll, I'll just quickly explore that now. So the, the plant biology, we, we took a, a range of, I'll put them up on screen here, a range of um, common crop registration measurements um, of the plant. And from uh, this crop these crop registration measurements, we inferred a plant balance uh, score. Um, and what I mean by plant balance was from these measurements, we inferred was the plant in a more vegetative state, producing a lot more leaves and foliage, or was the plant in a more generative state, producing more flowers, producing more fruit. And then we did a similar study where we looked at the the, the yield swing event uh, weeks that I talked about before that we tried to color, color um, uh, tried to relate what we were seeing in generative plants and vegetative plants to these yield swings events and we, we looked for patterns again and and here's what we discovered so you see here quite clearly um, when low swing weeks were happening plants were much more likely to be in a highly vegetative state and when high swing weeks were happening, the plants were much more likely to be in a generative state. <clears throat> now, we, we think um, this is actually interesting for all growers because this is something that's in our control, right? We can manipulate the plant. We can stimulate the plant in different ways by steering it to be more vegetative or more generative. And so let's take as an example um, here of what we might want to do when faced with a certain situation um, such as the one let's say with high high yield swing so let's say we we have a yield prediction that's looking pretty pretty steady but our context around our plant balance is telling us our plant is actually in a highly generative state um, we've got a risk there that our yield prediction is going to be wrong and we're actually going to overproduce from our yield prediction so what we might want to do is have a look at the um, the commercial conditions for the, our tomato produce in this case we might want to see what are tomato prices doing? Can I get a good price for my produce right now? If the market conditions are favorable, actually a grower might want to lean into that and continue to encourage that generative state of the plant because they're actually okay to overproduce because they know they're going to get a good price for their produce. On the inverse of the market conditions, perhaps in that case weren't so good, they might want to stimulate the plant to make it more vegetative and slow the, the fruiting process down in the plant. Um, before I, I sort of wrap up and give a little bit of a conclusion about what we think this means for tomato growers, I just want to very quickly touch on quality uh, because we know it's not just all about producing weight, producing yield. We know that quality is really important for growers as well, particularly tomato growers in, in our particular experience. And we, we haven't done this study yet uh, in the context of quality. We haven't looked for the swings in quality and, and look for the specific context uh, for what might vary quality. But um, through our experience, we've seen some of our customers, some of some organizations in our network do something similar to what I've described here with quality. We, we know a, a story of one of our customers that had um, some feedback from from their customer, their, their supply chain that, that we were uh, producing into, that they were getting, the supermarkets were getting a variation in shelf life of their tomato. And, um, you know, some tomatoes, were, some of their, their produce was um, keeping really well on the shelf, not so much with others. 
and they managed to sort of triangulate which greenhouses were tending to produce this fruit that had a lower shelf life sort of quality. And then through using data and, and context, similar to what I've shown you today, they were able to see some patterns of variation uh, with what would the data, how the data was behaving and what sort of practices also were being applied to the plant and uh, in relation to the, the higher performing greenhouses that is. And they were able to, to start to firstly standardize their practices, um, have practices take place that were more consolidated quite similar to the higher performing greenhouses. And then what the growers actually did was use the data to produce a, a data-driven evidence-based business case to their leadership team um, to, to, I guess, pitch the case to upgrade the infrastructure of the greenhouse. And they did do that. And they were now getting much more consistent results with their quality because they managed to take that sort of variation in context that the data was telling them away. And then um, I'll just wrap up now. And what does all of this mean for tomato growers in, in that yield context that I started with before? Well, we think um, yield prediction can be far more effective when it's supported by relevant local insights, such as what I showed you today. These were just some examples of what we discovered from about approximately a thousand weeks of tomato uh, production. Uh, but if you're a tomato grower, you might have different local relevant, you know, local insights that might be telling you something different around your yield prediction. And we would encourage you to, to study when, when you see that. Um, we think that most tomato growers should actually abandon any quest they might have for absolute precision yield prediction you know striving for 100 percent prediction accuracy we think that is a, a waste of effort to an extent um, we think that more effort should be put into understanding the context around what's going on with your yield so that you can make more contextual interpretations of the yield prediction we think any grower should be investigating the yield swings. When your yield prediction gets it wrong, take a look at the data and look backwards. Eight weeks is what we did in our case and see what patterns you can find because they might help you build a library of context you can look for in the future. And then lastly, uh, we, we found that plant, the state of the plant, if it was generative or vegetative, that was a very strong uh, determining kind of factor in um, overall underproduction in the context of yield prediction. So any grower that is not performing uh, crop registration that might be listening to me, uh, we'd really recommend you do so because it can give you, again, another powerful vector or, or angle of sort of con context to interpret your yield. And, and it's actually something you can control the plant state. Um, so we'd really encourage you to, to start that practice. Anyway, that, that's me finished. Um, we'll be publishing a white paper uh, with more detail around the study that I've summarized today. Um, if you're interested in seeing that white paper, you can contact me at the email address shown on the screen there. Uh, if you're just interested in talking about data-driven growing as well, I'd be happy to talk to you as well. Just reach out via that email, please. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Okay, right, let's cut to the chase. We've got some questions for you already, um, and probably both of them are the ones I was gonna ask anyway. So Claudia Berry Gardens asking, so that's tomato. Are you extending it to other crops? And if so, what? Yeah, that's a good question. We've only um, done it with tomatoes. Tomatoes is the um, tomato production is the crop type we have the most experience with uh, for yield prediction. Uh, but we, we do help customers with uh, pepper production, cucumber production and blueberry production as well. So we, we're going to be, we've got a sort of a roadmap of um, understanding this context further with those different crop types. Um, but we th we think, you know, crop types outside the ones I listed as well, if you grow those, it'd be worthwhile taking a similar approach. Cool. So a uh, colleague of mine, uh, Julian Goring at Garden, is a sensor company, which is how are you ground, what ground truth data are you using for your prediction? Okay. Is this just hardcore data you're getting from the growers? Yeah, this is this is actually the production data that yep. we use as ground truth data to to train to train our models. So, what have they actually observed in the real world as the uh, harvest, essentially? Cool. Okay. Um, the most obvious one is what's the cost of the system? So, and, and and are you are you calculating any return on investment for the system at the minute? Can you give a feel for that? Uh, 
I, I can't really. Um, we do, we do for our customers, but um, one of the one of the things we, we find is um, our customers like us to keep the, those some of those numbers confidential because they believe we they get a bit of an edge from it. Um, but you know, it's it's not uncommon to be you know helping customers in the the double digit percentages. Cool. Okay. The interesting bit, there's two things. The identifying the factors impacting really kind of identified areas where the growers need to invest in infrastructure for control. Um, and that, that looked quite interesting. And also you, the way you were talking about using the systems absolutely for that, not just to increase yield, but also for investment within systems more widely. It's not often you see something, a uh, process that allows you to do that, is, is, which is which is good. But is this new way getting any pushback from what might be traditional growers? Yeah, yeah, some it can do. Like I mean, like anything in a in a in a industry that has a long history, you know, change um, in digital growing in particular. It's a digital growing concept. Um, you know, that change. You know, we as humans can can struggle to absorb that change sometimes. Um, but we, the way we try and work with that is, is first show the value, right, and show how we can actually re remove pain for the grower, help the grower be more successful. So we tend to run a lot of proof of concepts before we do uh, full deployments and sort of get some quick wins with the growers with some yeah. of the techniques I talked about today. Uh, and we also take a, a highly educative, consultative approach where we're um, spending a lot of time helping growers um, understand how to interpret data, how data can be kind of a secret source for them and, and help them do really, you know, smart interventions rather than, you know, long time consuming, laborsome sort of intervention. Okay. Thanks, Sean. I will let you go now. Um, more, everyone's talks, I think, are going to be available on Monday. So I would urge you to go over Sean's talk again there uh, and mine over that. It was really interesting. His contact details are there. They're already on the other part of the platform. Please contact Sean. Thanks very much, Sean. Cool. Thank you. See you, everybody. Bye.